Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining the call. Uh, my name is Paul DeVito from Signum Global Advisors. Um, this call is going to be held with Ambassador Lou Lukins, uh, who's going to talk about the U.S. election and potential policy changes in the States. Um, Lou will speak for roughly 30 minutes, and we're going to open up the floor to Q&A. As a very, very brief introduction, uh, Ambassador Lukins worked for the U.S. Foreign Service for over 30 years, quite literally all over the world. He's worked for five different administrations, and uh, his last posting was actually here in London. Um, he then left the Foreign Service and has joined Signum Global Advisors uh, and has brought his vast knowledge and expertise of both U.S. and domestic, U.S. domestic and U.S. foreign policy, and has given us a great outlook on what we hope to come. Uh, Lou, over to you. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining this call. And uh, I just want to thank um, Karen from the Wharton Club of the UK for setting up this event. Um, I'm actually going to try to keep my introductory remarks fairly brief so we can leave more time for discussion and, and for questions. I know that by definition, everyone on this call is either American or spent a fair amount of time in the U.S. at, at university. So um, this, is an edu this is an audience that um, understands, I think, pretty well the U.S. electoral system. Um, so let me just dive right in and address some of the um, discussion points that were in the invitation, and then we'll open it up. So um, the first question or the discussion point was about polling, and what do polls tell us about this election? So the polls have been actually very consistent this year, and, you know, it's important, of course, to distinguish between national polls and battleground uh, polls, but let me start with the national polls. Biden on a national level has consistently been polling between seven and ten points ahead, and um, we hear a lot these days, you know, what about 2016? The pollsters got it wrong. Everyone said Hillary was going to win, and then she didn't. Um, what is different this year? And there are a couple of things different this year, but before I dive into those, I would just say that at this point, five days before the election, four years ago, Hillary was up in the national polls by 1.3 points, and Biden is up today by 7.7 .7 points. So she was clearly within the margin of error and it was a much closer race four years ago, Joe Biden on a national level enjoys a much bigger uh, lead than she did four years ago. A couple of reasons that this year, though, is different. First of all, the pool of undecided voters this year is much smaller. Last year in the month leading up to the election, roughly 15 percent of the U.S. electorate hadn't made up their mind yet. Um, this year, it's been less than 5 percent. Basically, most Americans know who they're going to vote for at this point. Um, so there's much less um, flexibility in the polls. People have already made up their minds. Um, another issue this year that's different is third-party votes. Um, there, there are some third-party um, candidates running this year, but not with the, na the national um, stature that, that the candidates had four years ago. And last year, uh, four years ago, some of the third-party candidates siphoned a lot of votes off, um, especially from Hillary Clinton. Another uh, difference this year is favorability. Um, four years ago at this time, both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton had net negative favorability um, ratings. They were seen ne negatively by more Americans than, than who saw them positively. Um, Donald Trump still has a net negative rating. He's never um, gotten above 50 percent. But Joe Biden is above 50 percent. More Americans see him positively than negatively. Um, so that's a big difference, too. And then finally, on the polling, I'll just say that a lot of the big polling companies did postmortems after the election four years ago, especially around Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, those three states that Donald Trump won by a total of about 77,000 votes, to see what they had gotten wrong. And what the, the, there were a couple of things they did wrong, but the main one was they had not, um, they had not talked to enough non-college-educated white voters. And those, that was the group that went for Donald Trump at the last minute and gave him the margin of victory. So the polls this year have waited uh, to count for more non-college educated white voters. So the polls are more accurate in that sense. Uh, let me talk quickly just about some demographic shifts that have also changed the dynamic this year. 
older voters have traditionally been Republican voters, and Donald Trump won over 65-year-old voters by seven points in the last election. That group is now polling um, 20 points in favor of, of Joe Biden. So Donald Trump is seeing a loss of over 25 points uh, in that demographic. Um, young voters, young, the Republicans never really had young voters in huge numbers. The, the issues that young voters care about and are passionate about are much more aligned with the Democratic Party, whether it's you know, student debt, uh, racial justice, climate change, things like that. But young voters didn't vote in great numbers in 2016. They didn't like Donald Trump, but they also didn't like Hillary Clinton particularly. So a lot of them sat that election out. We saw them come back in big numbers in the 2018 midterms, uh, which is how the House um, was flipped back to the Democrats. And I think we'll see that we are seeing them already in big numbers this year. And finally, women. Um, women, um, Trump lost women by about 10 to 12 percent um, four years ago, but he's losing them by over 20 percent now in polling. So another big shift in a really key and large demographic. So um, at the national level, um, Joe Biden has a very solid lead. Um, the battleground states, though, as you all know, the, our system is based on the Electoral College. Um, at this point, if the election were held today based on polling, Joe Biden would win 290 Electoral College votes, and Trump would win 163, and there are, about 85, there are 85 Electoral College votes in five states that are really um, up for grabs, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Iowa, and Ohio. Trump would have to win all five of those states and a couple other states. It probably picked up from Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Arizona. Um, Joe Biden is slightly ahead in Arizona, um, but he's pretty solidly ahead in Michigan and Wisconsin and staying about four points ahead in Pennsylvania. So bottom line is that if you look at the Electoral College maps and the distribution of battleground states, Joe Biden has a much he has many more paths to Electoral College victory than Donald Trump has. Donald Trump has to win Florida. He has to win North Carolina, um, Arizona. He has to pick up some of these states that are really close right now. Um, another narrative that we hear a lot is the shy Trump voter who it isn't reflected in polling because they don't want to say they're voting for Trump or they're you know, embarrassed or whatever. Um, we don't actually see a lot of data to support this. Um, actually, sort of as opposed to that, we think a lot of registered Republicans – will vote for Biden this year, and we are seeing that in the data. Um, and even if it is true that there are shy Trump voters, um, it's also true that young people are not reflected well in polls. They don't tend to answer polls. So we think that would balance out any shy Trump voter um, scenario. This election is really a referendum on Donald Trump, and both sides are energized, and I think we're going to see huge turnout. Um, I'm sure people have been reading about early voting. Um, as of about an hour ago, um, over 79 million votes had been cast in the U.S. Um, that is over 57 percent of the total votes from four years ago. So if we hit, um, I've been sort of playing with the numbers here. So four years ago, turnout, voter participation rate was 55 and a half percent. The highest um, ever in the U.S. was 63 percent in 1908. And the highest in the modern era was 62.8% in 1960. So let's just, uh, for fun, say we have we hit we matched the record from 1908 and have 63% voter participation this year. That would mean about 160 million voters, which means that by the end of today, um, over half of this year's voters will have voted because we're going to hit 80 million early votes, I think, later today. Um, so all to back to the point of the polling it's too late for candidates to change minds. There's such a small pool of undecided voters. Half of, half of Americans have already voted, um, at least half. Um, this is all about turnout on election day. Voting thus far um, in the early voting is based on party registration because we don't know the votes haven't been counted yet. It's about 47% Democrat, 30% Republican, and 23% Independent. So we definitely expect um, a much more robust turnout of Republicans on Election Day. Donald Trump has spent the last couple of months um, talking poorly about early voting and mail-in ballots and convincing his supporters that they should show up in person. Um, and and this, is, this was borne out by what we're seeing with the early voting numbers, um, a much higher percentage of Democrats voting early. It's a bit of a risky strategy for um, the Republicans. 
uh, the, the surge in COVID cases is causing some polling places to close. It's going to make it harder to find places to vote on Election Day. Um, they could do bad weather across the United States. So it's a bit of a risky strategy to count on a huge turnout on Election Day itself when the other side has had such a robust early voting. Um, but we'll see what happens on Tuesday. Um, we are um, confident uh, at Signum. We've done a lot of work on this in a, in a Democratic sweep. So I, I think I've I sort of talked about why we think Biden is going to win. Um, we don't think there'll be a contested election. We actually think Biden is going to win in enough states with enough of a margin that even if a state like Pennsylvania comes down to the wire and uh, because they don't count ballots early and it might take them a couple of days to figure out who won there, um, we think it won't matter because Joe Biden will have won in enough other states that Pennsylvania will be not irrelevant but not decisive to the victory. Um, so we think there'll be some legal wrangling. Both sides are ready with teams of lawyers spread across the country, ready to file suits. Um, but we think Biden's going to um, – we think we'll know by next Wednesday morning that Biden has won the election. But the House is going to stay um, Democratic. In fact, we think the Democrats will pick up probably around 10 to, to 15 seats in the House. The Senate's a little bit trickier, but we do think the Democrats will end up with a majority of 50 to 53 seats. Uh, right now they have 47 uh, they're going to lose Alabama, I think, so they'll need four seats to, to gain control of the Senate. Um, Arizona, Colorado, and Maine are looking pretty good for the Democratic challengers. Um, so they need one more seat from North Carolina, Iowa, the two races in Georgia, and Montana. And so we're confident that they'll get enough seats to gain control of the Senate. And I'll come back to that in a second because that has implications for Joe Biden's um, priorities once he's in office. Um, so what to look for next Tuesday night? Um, there's some key swing states that are going to announce early that night. Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, and Arizona all have pretty well-run electoral systems in their states. They are already receiving early voting, and they are processing them. That's the key thing. Those states, they're allowed to process and open ballots and have them ready to count on Election Day. Um, other states, like Georgia and Pennsylvania, don't allow early processing of election of the ballots. So they don't even open the envelopes until election day, at which point then they start verifying signatures and, you know, that they're legitimate voters and those kinds of things. So if, if Florida next Tuesday night is called for Joe Biden, basically the race is over. Donald Trump has no path to the White House without Florida. So if you're going to watch any state next Tuesday night, I'd watch Florida. Um, there's some questions about what happens in the lame duck period, sort of this quirk of the American system that we have this long period of over two months between the election and the, and the handing over of power. Um, both sides are already gearing up for transition. There's a very large transition team, um, well, there's a large Biden transition team already working in Washington, and there are officials on the, in the Trump administration who are working with the Biden team to help them start preparing for handing over power should it should Trump lose next week. Um, we don't think that um, we, that Donald Trump will um, cause too much damage during the lame duck period. We think that he will be very focused on his future commercial opportunities in the United States, whether it's in real estate or in, you know, some kind of media slash show business um, world, you know, creating his own, TV network or, or radio network. So we think that actually Donald Trump will, um, once the election result is known, the Republican Party will start looking to the future and rebuilding its party and will distance itself from Donald Trump. And we think Donald Trump will be fairly quiet. Not to say he's going to accept the election graciously. Um, he'll complain about it. I'm, I think he'll say he was cheated out of it. Uh, but at the end of the day, he will recognize that he does more damage to his brand by, by causing chaos and division in the United States than by, rel by going out relatively quietly. So we think not much happens, um, certainly not from a legislative and policy point of view in Washington, but we're also a little bit less worried about um, sort of upheaval in Washington during the lame duck period. So President, a President Biden comes into office on January 20th. What does he focus on initially? So a couple of things. Um, the new Congress will be sworn in on January 3rd. And since the, the next round, the phase four stimulus um, 
package never got or did not that it never got anywhere, but it didn't get passed uh, before the election. That'll be the number one priority. So we think the new Congress will, will get to work on that and have something passed for the president to sign on his first day in office on January 20th. And then he will pivot to what are his really his two big priorities, reforming the tax code, basically raising taxes on corporations and wealthy Americans, and a large infrastructure package, which is tied in with or woven throughout with green energy, renewable energy. Um, it's not the Green New Deal, but it's a very um, environmentally friendly, climate change focused infrastructure package of about two and a half trillion dollars. And for both of those things, he, he will be able to do with um, a simple majority in the Senate using a process called the budget reconciliation process, which allows the pres- or allows the Senate and the Congress to pass one bill a year each for revenue and for spending. And we think that's what he'll use the, that one opportunity for, is one, one for taxes and one for infrastructure. He will also immediately have lined up executive orders to reverse a lot of what Donald Trump has done. Donald Trump undid a lot of President Obama's executive orders when he came into office. And we think that Joe Biden is going to use executive orders to reverse a lot of those reversals of Obama's orders, especially around energy and the environment. So a lot of what President Trump has done has been to sort of deregulate the business environment in the United States and to um, loosen uh, regulations around the environment. And Joe Biden has been very clear that he's going to go back to that. And we can, we can dive into this in greater detail um, during the Q and A if people want. And then on the foreign policy side, um, I mean, Joe Biden comes very much from a foreign policy background, but he's going to be a hundred percent focused on the domestic situation on trying to get a handle on coronavirus. He will have a task force set up some speculation that the task force may even be able to start working during the transition, even though they won't have taken power yet. I, I, we'll have to, we'll watch that closely. I'm not so sure that that's going to work, but now, it would depend on Donald Trump giving them approval to do that. Uh, but he will clearly be focused and have a very specific plan. He's already started talking about it to, to deal or to tackle coronavirus. Um, and then, as I said, the stimulus and taxes and infrastructure, these will be his focuses. He's not going to have a lot of time and energy to focus on foreign policy. So he will delegate that to his foreign policy and his national security team. But the priorities will be to rebuild alliances. Um, he's They've already already said he's going to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. He's going to restart some form of nuclear negotiations with Iran, not to just completely reprise the old nuclear deal, but to try to build on it. That will be a slow process, but they'll start it right away. He's talked about creating an alliance of democracies to push back on authoritarian regimes around the world. Um, Trade will look different. Um, especially because of the coronavirus and a lot of what Joe Biden has proposed to do is very much an America first plan in the sense of bringing production onshore to the United States um, and, and, and sort of reducing our supply chain reliance on the rest of the world, especially on China. Um, he'll be tough on China. Uh, the notion that, that the president has tried to put out that Joe Biden is soft on China, is, is there's no evidence of that. He's always been pretty tough on China, but our China policy be more coordinated not just within the U.S. government, but with allies all around the world. And he will work especially with the European Union, we think, and Canada and Mexico and partners in, in the Pacific to try to push back on China's um, trade policies, but also its military aggression in the region. And we'll have much more of a focus on human rights that we've seen in the, than we've seen in the last four years. Uh, the relations with Turkey will be tougher, with Russia, um, Saudi Arabia, certainly tougher. But as I said, I think relations with the European Union um, and Canada and some of our more traditional allies will be smoother than they have been over the last four years. Um, And then finally, there was a question about what would, if Trump does win, um, what would a second Trump term look like? It's a little harder to answer that because the Republican Party didn't publish a policy platform this summer. And Donald Trump has been asked a couple times what he would hope to accomplish in the second term and has sort of a hard time expressing uh, what he would like to accomplish. But what we think would, a couple of things. One is further deregulation. I mean, he, he fervently believes that deregulating the economy leads to growth. Um, so he will continue to do that. Um, he, it, unclear what his approach to coronavirus would be. He, he seems to um, have taken the attitude that we, that it's gone and that we have turned the corner. Um, if he's reelected, I think he'll be forced to deal with it in some manner 
And then on foreign policy, I think he'll look for opportunities to cement his legacy as a deal maker. So he'll try to build on the deals that they've recently helped broker between Israel and some of the other Arab countries in the region to, to normalize relations there. Um, there's some speculation that he would also be interested in uh, crafting some sort of Iran nuclear deal with Iran. Um, of course, a lot of work would be required for that. Um, but it's generally, it's a little bit hard to know what Trump's second term would look like just because he's been a little bit unpredictable in his first term and has not um, – has not expressed really a view of what the second term would look like. So let me leave it there. Um, I think that's enough talking for me for now or enough for my presentation and really happy to take questions on, on anything. So if you have a question, just hit four star and that will unmute yourself. And please identify yourself when you ask the question. Just four star to unmute yourself. No questions? Hi, this is Bob Ravelli here in London. Um, what would you say would be the impact on um, uh, the U.K.'s relationship with the U.S. should Biden win in terms of the, uh, the post-Brexit uh, U.K. and bars his obvious support of Trump over the years? And uh, what do you see... Do you see any kind of um, frostier relationship with the UK with Biden because of the actions of Boris and the over and the and the Brexit situation? Yeah, and that's a great question. Look, it's, it's, it's sort of no secret that Obama and, and the Democrats weren't um, didn't think that Brexit was a great idea, and were disappointed with the results of of, of the vote um, back in 2016. I, I think that the notion that the Biden administration will be hostile to the UK is a little bit overblown. There's been a lot in the media here, some speculation about that. I do think that that the Biden administration will instinctively feel closer to the European Union because um, it just it, it provides more of a, um, a, a format or a, a venue to, to work closely with a lot of allies at the same time. So it'll be easier in some ways for them. Um, the UK, I think, can still play a very important role, and it, the special relationship um, still exists on sort of the defense and security and intelligence sharing side. The reality is, despite, you know, sort of a friendliness between President Trump and Prime Minister Boris Johnson, the relationship over the last four years has had a lot of um, difficulties, and there have been some real policy issues on which the U.S. and the U.K. have disagreed, including sort of how to deal with China and Russia, um, Iran, the Iran nuclear deal, climate change. So on a lot of those issues, I, I mean, ironically, a Democratic administration will probably be more closely aligned with British values and traditional British policies. So, and I don't think Biden and his team will hold a grudge. So I think there's a real opportunity here um, for, but I think the, the onus will be on Prime Minister Johnson to reach out early to the new team and say, look, you know, we're hosting the G7 next year. We're hosting this big climate change conference next year. Um, let's really work together uh, side by side and, and craft policies and promote policies that we both believe in. The question is whether they have the bandwidth um, to do that with everything else going on, still trying to leave the, the EU and dealing with coronavirus. As far as um, the U.S.-U.K. trade agreement, I mean, you know, I think there was hope on both sides that it would be finalized before the election. That's clearly not going to happen and what I think will happen is that, um, you know, the, the, the draft, and as far as the negotiations have gotten, will sit on a shelf for the first couple of months while Joe Biden gets his trade team and his U.S. trade rep and other officials installed. And then, you know, at some point they'll pick it up and they'll want to make changes because the Democrats traditionally have different uh, objectives and trade deals than the Republicans. Additionally, there's all the sort of the new COVID-related um, trade and foreign policy issues that the Democrat that Joe Biden has published and, you know, and is part of his many plans, which will be more focused on the, dealing with America's supply chain and giving priority to creating jobs in America. So that'll change a little bit the dynamic of the negotiations. So I still think it's possible that a trade deal happens, but I don't think it'll happen next year. I can see it being finalized in 2022 and then going to Congress and, and being finalized, you know, 
maybe two years from now, if not a little bit earlier. Great, thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? It's four star. Hi, this is Max Stoiber from London. Also, do you have a sense of whether uh, Biden, if he wins, will take over or will continue the hard stance on sort of NATO and NATO military spending in Europe? Uh, and what what other sort of counterintuitive, perhaps counterintuitive, foreign policy stances of the Trump administration do you think Biden might actually seek to continue? Well, I think Biden is, is, is sort of has always been a huge fan and proponent of NATO's. So um, I think, you know, and, and it was under President Obama and, and when Joe Biden was vice president that the U.S. got the NATO countries to commit to increasing, you know, to getting up to 2% of, for their, their contribution to their defense budget. Um, it's just that they weren't as aggressive as pushing the countries to get there as President Trump has done. And, and President Trump has actually been quite effective on that, and a lot of countries have increased their spending. So I think there will be pressure on, on Biden from the Biden administration for, the, for these countries not to suddenly think, oh, Trump's gone, now we can sort of relax and, and go back to, you know, cut our defense spending closer to what it was before. Um, so I think in that sense, Joe Biden is very supportive of NATO, and I think he has a better understanding of, of what NATO exists for. Um, but I don't think he will um, be, I mean, he'll probably try to do it a little bit more diplomatically, but he will still, I think, hold by, or, you know, abide by the, the standards that Donald Trump has, has reiterated over and over that these countries have to meet that target. Um, as far as other, I mean, I think Joe Biden will probably on the trade front will probably um, roll back some of the tariffs that Donald Trump put in based on national security concerns. And this is mostly ones aimed at the European Union and the UK and Canada, steel and aluminum and some other products where they use national security as a rationale for, for doing that, which was a bit of a stretch. Um, but overall, I think on trade, a, a Biden administration will be pretty tough and very focused on American workers and American and labor law in America and environmental standards. So they may in some ways be more aligned with the EU and, and the UK on some of those issues. But it's going to be very much about helping about trying to rebuild America and protect American workers. Um, it, it always would have been, but much more so now with the coronavirus and, and trying to rebuild the economy. I hope that answered your question. Oh, oh hello, uh, Lou. This hello. is Karen Abbott. Hello, Lou. This is Karen Abbott. Yep. Can you hear me? <laughs> yep, I can hear you. Um, great. Um, I was just wondering if you could, if you uh, do know, if you could give us a few more details on what this large infrastructure package might look like as it takes shape in Congress. Um, do you think it will be focused on in, uh, promoting support for renewable energy? There's been a lot of talk about uh, tax extender bills and refundability of tax credits and all of that sort of thing. Do you have any insight as to what the infrastructure package might look like? Yeah, so um, there's been a lot of... Um of writing about this and, and it, it's a bit of a work in progress and it's grown. So earlier this year, it was going to be $1.3 trillion. Now it's up to probably two and a half trillion dollars. Um, but it's, he's going to argue that the, that the economy needs this to rebuild and create jobs. So his plan is, is defined as having three overarching goals, creating good middle-class jobs, building a green infrastructure to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to revitalize small towns and low-income communities. And what he's going to do, Joe Biden has benefited this whole year um, from support from the progressive base of the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party is more united right now than it has been ever. And it, it took Donald Trump to, reun to unite the Democratic Party. Um, and, you know, this is part of the problem four years ago that hurt Hillary Clinton was that the progressives and Bernie Sanders and that wing of the party – felt, um, you know, sort of they, they were disappointed in how the primaries had turned out, and they never really got behind Hillary Clinton 
in the national campaign. This year, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and the progressive wing of the party is very clear right up front. Like, we are behind Joe Biden once he got the nomination, and we're with him. But there is, there is a sense in the progressive wing of the party that we, we were behind you this whole year, but you're going to owe us. And part of how he's going to pay that debt, and I'm making finger quotes in the air here, is by weaving in a lot of um, the, the renewable energy, green climate into this infrastructure plan, but also this focus on low-income communities and revitalizing them. So the plan itself focuses on transportation. It's like roads and bridges, uh, transitioning to electric and low-carbon vehicles, high-speed rail, um, urban transit, better planning, better airports, better freight infrastructure. It's focused on resilience, so it's going to try to address climate change and deal with things like natural disasters and coastal erosion. Uh, there'll be a big focus on energy, um, expanding the renewable energy production um, and evolving the electric grid in the United States and making buildings, having higher standards for energy efficiency in buildings. Um, there'll be a focus on water, clean water in disadvantaged communities, new piping systems, uh, new water technology, uh, broadband, and, and certainly the coronavirus um, and the, the lockdowns have brought this home that like the broadband is not something that people have equal access to across the United States and lower income communities are really disadvantaged. So um, the, the plan will focus on closing what they call the digital divide and ensuring that broadband um, access is available in all households across the country. And then schools, and then there's about, you know, a couple hundred billion dollars in there to rebuild and modernize schools. So that's, that's the plan. And, and the green renewable energy is, is sort of woven through all of it, whether it's schools or water or, or you know, transportation. Everything's going to have a focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and shifting to renewable energy, transitioning to renewable energy. Thank you, Lou. It's, it's certainly been um, predicted over here that it could create a, a whole new energy revolution. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, this is um, Catherine Pfeiffer in London. Hi, Catherine. Um, and I was wondering, um, I imagine with the, with the efforts on the wall uh, on the Mexican border be halted, but how, how would he deal with immigration from Latin America and dealing with the violence there that's causing people to want to escape to America and, and what would be the policy towards our neighbors closer to home? Yeah, great question. So it, you're right. I mean, I think construction on the wall would stop immediately. Um, so that, that would end. Um, Biden has a plan to put a lot of money into those Central American countries from, from which a lot of the refugees come um, to help them deal, to help build their economies and to deal with the violence there. Um, this has been tried before, and it has had varying levels of success, but he has a whole plan carved out to try to do that. To, and then as far as immigration itself, you know, the, the Congress and the Senate have tried immigration reform for years and never, and never really got anywhere. We think Biden um, will try to do as much as he can through executive order. We think he'll, he'll try to protect the dreamers, um, prevent them from being kicked out of the country. He'll, he'll do things like he'll get rid of, Again, coming back to the executive orders, he'll get rid of um, the Muslim ban. Um, he'll, so a lot of what, uh, you know, the Trump administration has really drastically cut back the number of refugees that America takes in. I think that'll go back to more to the levels that, it, that we had, you know, four years ago and beyond that. Um, but to address the question of people coming into the country illegally, I mean, look, the, the Joe Biden will still keep you know, law enforcement at the border and, 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 and border controls in place, uh, but will not continue building the wall. And as I said, we'll focus on trying to deal with some of the issues that drive this um, immigration to the United States. Uh, we'll, we'll have the plan to try to deal with some of those issues at the source. Um, and again, those plans have met with limited success before. And I haven't seen the details of this plan, so I'm not sure how it differs from previous plans. But, you know, just sort of a bit of a side note here, um, Biden is surrounded by uh, national security and foreign policy and, and defense department experts who have all served in previous administrations. And I, I know some of them, and my hunch is that they're, they're pretty um, 
the ones that I know are a fairly self-aware group and will, I think, be able to be honest enough to say, you know, what we tried six years ago or eight years ago didn't work. So let's learn from that lesson and try something different. No guarantee that the new plan will work either. But I think what we'll see is some creative ideas building on experience that teams had from working on these issues throughout the eight years of the Obama administration. Thank you. Hi, this is Margo in London. I have a question for you on foreign policy. Mm -hmm. You had referenced, I believe, President Trump's success with the Abraham Accords just recently, but you had mentioned that you would expect the Biden administration to be much tougher on Saudi Arabia. So I'm curious to hear what you would envision as the next step in U.S.-Israel Middle East relations if Biden is, in fact, elected. So he, he, he has talked about the need for Arab countries to normalize relations with Israel. So I think he would not walk away from the Abraham Accords. I think he would continue what the um, Trump administration is trying to do, which is to have additional countries sign on to normalize relations with Israel. That said, he would take a very different approach to the Middle East peace issue. Um, he would restore aid to, to the Palestinians, which has been cut off under Trump, and he would restore diplomatic relations with, with the Palestinians. Um, the Palestinians. We never had four embassies in each other's countries, but the Palestinians did have an office in Washington and, and our embassy in Jerusalem, our consulate in Jerusalem, used to be our unofficial or de facto embassy to the Palestinians. So we go back to that kind of situation where we had offices in each other's countries to have more normalized relations. Um, but he'd be, it'd be a little bit tougher on Israel in the sense that Biden would say, I mean, he's already spoken against any annexation and additional um, building of settlements in disputed territories. Um, and he is a believer in a negotiated two-state solution. So while he would encourage um, Arab countries to continue joining the Abraham Accords and to normalize commercial and diplomatic relations with Israel, he would also revert to a more traditional American um, policy on Middle East peace, which is that it has to be a negotiated two-state solution. Great. Any other questions? Just hit four star. Hello, Hello? this is uh, Doug. Hello, this is Doug Kudra, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I had a question, uh, Margo. You just stole one of my two questions, so that, that's great. But my other foreign policy question was: How do you think uh, Biden presidency would um, interact with what I guess I would call democratic strongmen, people, uh, you know, countries like Turkey, Brazil, India, Hungary? Yeah, I think there's mu there'll be much less tolerance um, and affinity with those leaders than we see now. Certainly Turkey, Biden already has a contentious relationship with President and Erdogan, with President Erdogan and, and, and has very little patience um, for him. So I think that relationship will be difficult. And remember, you know, for in, in the example of Turkey, um, there's sort of congressional unanimity that, that, that he has been a very destructive, he's playing a destructive role in the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean. And it's President Trump who has really prevented Congress from being able to sanction, pass sanctions on Turkey that are, that are more difficult or tougher. And I think with, with President Biden, we'll see more um, activism, I guess is the right word, on the part of congressional Republicans and Democrats um, to let their displeasure be known with countries like um, Turkey and Russia uh, and Saudi Arabia. Um, so, you know, when Biden talks about an, an alliance of democracies to, to sort of work to combat the spread of authoritarianism around the world, those are the kinds of countries that he has in mind uh, as, you know, as the foil for his alliance of democracies. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Yes, um, this is Michael Wynn calling from Houston, Texas. I would like to hear your perspectives uh, in regarding to the Biden administration with uh, countries in China, partic uh, in Asia, rather, particularly China and uh, North Korea. So on China, um, you know, President uh, President Biden will continue to be tough with China on trade, but he'll I think he'll take a more 
you know, when he was vice president, he participated in what the Obama administration carried out with China every year, what they called the strategic and economic dialogues. And they would have very high level meetings every year with both sides. And they alternated between Washington and Beijing um, to talk about a whole range of issues that affect both countries, uh, including economic and trade issues, but also military and other issues. Um, under the Trump administration, he's been very tough on China on trade, but it's been, um, and this is, I mean, this is just my opinion, obviously, it's been a little bit one-dimensional. So I think what we'll see with China is a return to a more comprehensive approach to the relationship. doesn't mean it's going to be any easier, and President, uh, President Biden will focus more than President Trump has on human rights, including things like democracy in Hong Kong and what's happening with the Uyghur um, people in Xinjiang province. So I think it'll, you know, it, it'll be, and, and, and on questions about tech, technology and, you know, 5G and infrastructure, those issues are not going to go away. And there will continue to be difficult issues between the United States and China. I just think that the United States will take a more comprehensive view toward those issues um, than now, where everything really seems to be seen through the prism of, of just trade uh, and the trade deficits. As far as other countries, I mean, North Korea, I, I, I honestly don't know. I, I haven't seen anything from the Biden campaign or their team on North Korea. Uh, I'm going to be on a Zoom call tomorrow afternoon with um, his foreign policy guy, and I might put that question. That's a good question. I mean, every administration has struggled with North Korea, uh, and there's always an opportunity for a reset with the new administration, but I'm not sure that the Biden administration has a, has a plan ready to go on that. Um, and then as far as other countries in, in, the, in the region, you know, I don't think we see a return to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, which the Obama administration put a lot of work into and, and President Trump walked away from. And I think the world has changed enough um, with coronavirus. And as I said, sort of the emphasis now on bringing the supply chain back to America. I, I don't see the U.S. relaunching a huge Asia-wide, you know, trade partnership to try to counter China. Um, but I think, you know, Japan and South Korea – I think we'll be relieved to see a President Biden. President Trump has been pretty aggressive in, in trying to get them to pay uh, more for hosting U.S. troops there. And I think I don't think Biden will continue that push. Um, anyway, that's kind of a quick overview. Anybody else? Just hit four star. Lou, sorry, I missed the, uh, the first few minutes of the call. You might have already covered this, but just in terms of the parlor game, in terms of uh, some of the names being thrown around for cabinet, any ideas there? Yeah, so um, we think Susan Rice is likely to be uh, the Secretary of State. We think um, Michelle Flournoy is probably likely to be Secretary of Defense. We think Leo Brainerd at Treasury. Um, Meg Whitman has been talked about for Commerce. Um, she's, she's a registered Republican, uh, but has endorsed Biden, and that would be seen as an effort to reach across the aisle a bit. Um, we think Tom Steyer ends up possibly at Energy, but possibly in a newly created role in the White House, but with cabinet-level authority to be a special climate czar. Um, again, as there'll be a lot of emphasis on um, climate change and r green energy, and this is a way for, for a President Biden um, not only to, to sort of satisfy some of the demands of the progressive wing of the party. I mean, President Biden does sincerely believe that something has to be done to address climate change. Um, so we'll have people in the administration. Jay Inslee, governor of Washington, also talked about for a possible energy or climate related role. Um, those are sort of the highlights. Um, yeah, we'll see. I think, you know, if Biden wins on Tuesday and we know by, you know, Wednesday or so that he's won, I think we'll very quickly, um, news will start to leak out of, of who his senior cabinet people will be because he will, he and his team will want to, um, give the impression, uh, or, or show the country that they are ready to to get to work on day one. And part of that, of course, we'll be getting a team, senior team in place to also be ready to start on day one. 
great insight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if there are no more questions, um, thank you all. And uh, I'll give you my email. My email is Lou, L-E-W, at signumglobal.com. So I'm happy to take any um, additional questions by email if you think of something later. Um, and thanks again um, to the Warden Pen Club of UK for the opportunity. Uh, hello. Hello, yep. Hi, I have one last question. My name's Brom. I'm calling from London. Uh, first of yep. all, thank you very much for your time and your, uh, and your talk. Um, the, the issue of immigration has already been touched on, but just uh, to kind of briefly, if you could expand, what, what sort of an approach do you think Joe Biden would potentially take towards skilled migration to the United States? And I suppose as a, as a last sort of uh, cheeky question, if I can ask, uh, under what circumstances could you see uh, President Trump upsetting the odds again? As in, you know, if, if, if he did have a last-minute surge in the polls and he, he won come Wednesday, what, what do you think the reason for that would have been? So let me, let me address the, the second part of that first. So if Trump wins again, a lot of people will have gotten this really wrong. And I think there'll be a lot of soul-searching for years about what happened. Um, I, don't, I mean, I honestly don't see it happening. It would take it would take a huge, huge turnout from his base. I'm not even sure that would be enough because I think we're also seeing huge turnout from young voters and, and people who are voting against Trump. So, um, but he would have to win those states that I mentioned, those toss-up states: Florida, Arizona, well, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, Ohio, um, and then he would have to win Pennsylvania too. And I think if he could if he could cobble together that group of six or seven states and win those states, um, then, you know, then he would win. I think the chances of that are extremely unlikely. Um, I think that, you know, they, they, there's been a couple of sort of quasi October surprises, um, you know, and the, the late the thing with the Hunter Biden and his laptop, but that never really got the traction that I think that the Trump campaign or some of the folks that were pushing that narrative, hoped it would get. And I think at the end of the day, the American people, this is, as, as I said earlier, such a referendum on Donald Trump himself and people willing to, you know, forgive Joe Biden for personal issues or, or policy issues because they're so determined to vote Donald Trump out of office. So I don't see anything that, and again, as I said earlier, about 50% of Americans who are going to vote this year, if not more, have already voted. So it's a little late with five days to go for the trajectory to change, I think. On immigration, um, I, I think, it, I don't think anything will happen next year besides what the president can do through executive order, but he can't change the sort of skills-based immigration system by executive order. That requires legislation in Congress. And, and as I said, this has been tried many, many times in Washington, and it's just, it's, it's really, really hard to pull together a legislative package on immigration that both sides can agree on. And they've tried and they've failed over the years. And it's not going to be a top top priority for Biden with everything else going on. So my sense is that the current system that we have, which is, you know, we have some skills-based immigration, but a lot of it is fam most of it is family-based, is that that will stay in place um, for the foreseeable future. I mean, I'd say at least the next year or two. Maybe that becomes legislative priority um, you know, in, in, in year two, the difficulty is in, in, in the Senate nowadays, you need 60 votes to get anything done unless you can do it through budget reconciliation where you just need 51. So as I said, the tax package, the infrastructure bill, he can get done with 51 votes. But anything else, police, police reform or justice reform, uh, changing voting laws, changing immigration, some of the things, and there's a whole long list of things that Democrats want to do you need 60 votes in the Senate to do that. So anything that, that a couple of Republicans disagree with, they can filibuster. So, you know, and it's a, it's a, you know, both sides do that. I'm not picking on Republicans. But it's very hard to get anything done if you have fewer than 60 seats in the Senate. And they're not going to have 60 seats. And Democrats are not going to have 60 seats in the Senate. So immigration, I think, is one of those would be nice to do, but it just doesn't get done next year. Thanks very much for that. And would you mind just repeating your email address again, please? Yeah, sure. It's Lou, just my first name, L-E-W, at signumglobal.com. Okay. Thank was you that, very much. Was that Signum? 
Signum, S-I-G-N-U-M. And our website is signumglobaladvisors.com, and uh, my email is on there too. So it's Signum, okay. Signum Global? Yeah, Signum Global. Dot com. Advisors is the name of the firm. My email oh, is right. lou at sigmundglobal.com. Sigmundglobal.com. Thanks very much, Lou. Appreciate it very much. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, and I uh, hope to hear from some of you. Bye-bye.